Hello, everybody. Welcome to historical EPIC Congress. Welcome to performance management section. Uh, today, we, we have a uh, real delicacy for you. We have a great guest and great topic. And just to let me know to have some introduction before introduce to you our main guest. First of all, uh, I would like to share with you some experience in the last few decades. Uh, we have witnessed great progress in basketball. Basketball is becoming more attractive, more dynamic, more interesting. But at the same time, basketball is becoming more demanding for players, for teams, and for staff members. Heavy workloads of training and competition, congested calendar of competition, frequent travel, some health and recovery issues, public pressure. All of these are a great challenge for sport professionals and scientists. For this reason, sports organizations, clubs, and national federations bring together teams of experts tasked with designing high performance system. Such systems are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary and have a very clear task to take care of the availability and performance of players and teams. Today, we have a privilege to have, you cannot imagine better guest, better speaker about this topic. This is Xavi Schelling. Just a few words about him. He was born in Spain, graduated in and did PhD at University of Leida, worked in basketball club Manresa in Spain and different Spanish uh, national basketball teams. And from 2014, he is a member of a famous NBA club, San Antonio Spurs. At this moment, Xavi is a director of athletic performance and sports science in San Antonio Spurs. But first of all, and most of all, the most important thing, Xavi Schelling is the game changer in high performance in basketball world. Xavi, welcome to historical EPIC Congress. And first of all, thank you for accepting this participation in our event. Hello, Igor. Uh, wow, very flattering words, uh, a little bit too much, uh, but thank you very much for the invitation. And, and thank you uh, to, for organizing this event. I think it's, it's amazing. It's something that we need. We need to explain what we do for the coaches and for the players. And the, I think that this platform is, is the perfect spot. So I'm honored to being invited here. And it's a pleasure for me to contribute in any way I can. It is our pleasure. Pleasure is mine. You know, but, but first of all, before all, before we start for this conversation, I would like to congratulate you on this career. And I want to congratulate you for your all previous professional and scientific achievements. In your career, you did something specific because you did some great symbiosis of practical work and scientific research. Then you have doctorate of science, but also you are every day confirming your researching and, and your scientific part in everyday life. Then, first of all, would you please be so kind and let us know about start of your career in a performance world and uh, how was your trip to MBA? Yeah. Um... I've been very curious. That's the first thing that uh, I would like to share. Uh, I'm very curious and I'm curious in all facets in my life. Uh, I, I, um, I need to be doing uh, things and not just embedded in, in routines. Um, and that's why I always worked a hundred percent obviously with the team that I've been, but at the same time I've been, uh, I kept ties with the academic world because I really like to keep learning. I really like to have a very good network of uh, World Cup professionals, and I'm very, very lucky because all my research, if you read my co-authors, are, are top names, and, and I've been very lucky of learning from all of them. 
Uh, so that's why there is a symbiosis be, be, between academia and professional world uh, along my career. Uh, my beginnings, uh, when I finished my college in, in sports science, um, I had a research grant in University of Lleida and I was combining that research grant with the biomechanical lab and the psychological lab, both uh, had me as a, a kind of an internship uh, for research. And at the same time, I was working in Barcelona in two basketball teams, being the head coach of a, a female basketball team, senior female basketball team, and leading uh, the performance and sports science area of um, a team in Badalona, uh, the San, San Josep de Badalona. Um, from there, and, uh, and it's important to understand all these contexts because I was uh, related with a lot of people and that's, that's what helps you to have opportunities. Um, I was involved in university, a lot of research. I was in, in different clubs. I was involved in any clinic that was invited. I, I went there. Um, and that network of connections allowed me to have one phone call. Jaume Pons are now from, at the time, uh, assistant coach in, in Basket Manresa was looking for a, a strength and conditioning coach slash sports scientist. Um, and I was the lucky guy. He asked to someone uh, in the University of Lleida and my name was there because I was there all the time. Um, and then I had the opportunity. Uh, I guess I had a good interview with the boss uh, and I was the chosen guy. Uh, guy and, and I started my career. I was nine years in Basket Manresa. Um, where we had ups, ups and downs. Uh, it's a very modest team, but very proud team. Uh, and we learned a lot how to maximize resources with not too much money. And, and again, the same, I kept doing the same thing, uh, keep doing my, my research, uh, connecting with different people. And very randomly, uh, nine years later in 2014, uh, yeah, 2014, um, a headhunters company from London um, sends me an email, very random email. We are looking for this position. If you are interested, send your CV. It's one of those things that, believe me, 99% of the times I would say delete email. This is not going to happen. So who cares? But, but I, for whatever uh, reason, I, I actually updated my CV. I sent the CV and then the, the interviews started. And four months later, I was again the chosen uh, one to go to the NBA, and I've been here for seven years. So, fantastic I'm very fortunate. Story. Fantastic story, and obviously you deserved it. But also, you gave to our participants, and especially to young people, already uh, two advices: to be curious and to be connected. Isn't it? Absolutely, uh, that, that's critical. You have to have a purpose and that's curiosity. And then you have to build your network to, to grow your opportunities. You have to work hard, but you have to have opportunities. Great. And uh, currently uh, you're working in MBA and uh, you lead some interdisciplinary team of people. And could you tell us please, uh, what is your general uh, job description there? And also, about the MBA structure of performance systems, your experience from your main uh, uh, job and experience maybe from other colleagues from MBA. Yeah, if I have to summarize the job description uh, of a sports scientist, especially here in the MBA sports scientist, uh, basically is, is building um, information systems that, that facilitate decision-making. That, that in one line, that's what we have to do. And depending on the context, depending on the organization, that will imply different things. Uh, if the organization is very mature and all the data workflow is perfect and the databases are well-structured, maybe you are more focused in front-end and changing and adding new technology uh, to the systems to make better decisions. Now, if you go into an organization that has nothing of that, none of that, there is no data collection processes, uh, there is no even a database. So that's where you have to start and spend a lot of time on the back end. That's not, uh, it's not shiny. It, it, no one realizes what you are doing, but if your foundation, if your structure, if your bones of your program are not well built, uh, later on, uh, you will have problems in terms of efficiency and, and the systems won't work. So I spent a lot of time 
uh, here in this organization, uh, connecting the dots and learning the ropes from a three months earlier, they were NBA champions. So learning the ropes from uh, probably one of the best organizations in the world, um, trying to learn what I wanted to achieve in the sports science department, but at the same time, based off the, the basis, what the club has already. Then we build a, a, a very robust uh, data structure. And then little by little, we vetted the technology that we wanted to uh, include in our program. Now with technology, let me add one thing that is critical. Before adding any technology, and this is something that we invested a lot of time internally, is you have to make sure that you know why you want the technology for. And by this, I mean, you have to talk with the front office and the scouts and what are the questions that they want to answer. And you as a sports scientist, you have to find the, the ways to answer that question. Sometimes it's with technology, sometimes it's changing methodologies that are already in place. The same with, this, with coaches, the same with the strength coaches, the same with physios, the same with doctors. And it's endless, it's literally endless. But the biggest question is data workflow has to be smooth and robust. Then you have to implement technology and methods based off the questions that you have in the organization and not just because your neighbor uh, has this toy, I'm gonna have this toy. So you have to be very, very purposeful. Yeah. Then maybe we can conclude that three process of, process of three phases, data, data collection, data management and data consuming is in the heart of your job, but also uh, you lead and you uh, communicate with interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, a team of people. And then this communication generally in life, but also in our job as performance specialist or head of performance or performance manager is very important in some tri three directions. Uh, first to players, of course, then to head coach, and then to staff members. You have to have a lot of communication skills to fulfill all these tasks. Can you tell us please uh, about your experience and this communication issue or this communication topic? Yeah, I, I would rephrase it. I wouldn't say that this is an issue, it's a challenge and we have to take it as a challenge. Uh, but you are absolutely right. In our industry, like in any other industry, communication is, is key. First of all, you have to have good professionals and good human beings in your roster in, and in your staff. Uh, but if you have that, the next challenge is to communicate because you can have the smartest people crunching numbers or the, smart, the smartest physiology or the smartest doctor. But if that information is not shared, that doesn't improve information system. So I think that information is critical. And for good information, I think there are two main things. One is, as I said, and fairly easy, but sometimes misunderstood is data has to be, and information has to be stored and structured properly it had, because I will facilitate to build tools to communicate better with dashboards, with uh, emails, with whatever that is reporting tools. Um, and the other part is trust. That's where you have to build personally with every one of the components of that huge organization. Uh, if you don't have trust, it's not just about your reporting system. It's not about your Excel sheet or your beautiful chart. If you don't, if you can't gain the trust from the other person, it doesn't matter what you say or what you send. That's not going to change their decision making. So um, I think that at the same time that we are building the bones and the data structure is solid, you have to build your confidence and your trust within the organization. And that implies going out of your way, not staying in front of your laptop all the time, but talking to people, talking to players, understanding every 15 players needs, understanding each one of them, communicating to assistant coaches, communicating to head coach, doctors, et cetera. I think that data structure, information structure, and trust and human connections are, are critical in our business. Yeah, and one more added question to, to this topic. Uh, what is regarding communication, the most demanding part of communication with which part of this? Sometimes, you know, some you have uh, difficulties with players, sometimes uh, to head coach understand your ideas and, and messages you send to him. And but sometimes uh, uh, 
uh, related to communication inside of performance stuff, you know, between sports scientists and medical stuff, sometimes there is no always uh, uh, all clear. Uh, what, what is your experience? Uh, some topics and some, some thoughts you can share with us. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it is a great question, actually. Um, it, it depends. It depends. F first of all, and, and, and specifically about the head coach, um, we are um, assisting the head coach and we, we, we don't have to forget that. The head coach is the, the final decision maker. So the head coach will know what he needs. And if he doesn't know what he needs and you are very strong in something that will make uh, his or her decision making better, you have to be very patient and educate this person on that. But don't try to force it because you are forgetting that they are the bosses. They, we are a service for them. Uh, and education is key. That approach is applicable to your colleagues that are at the same level and with the players. Uh, and the next step is head coach and the next step is the player. The player is for sure the most important uh, the person in all this process because at the end of the day, they are the ones making the threes. Um, so again, you have to be the way that I personally take this is I try to read the locker room. You know, you can identify uh, different leaders, different types of leaders in the locker room. And if you are new in our organization, if you can gain that trust as fast as possible with an influential player in the locker room, it's going to be way easier for you to sell the rest, uh, the, the, your program to the rest of the locker room because you have one of the influential players. Um, that strategy applies in, in many worlds, uh, but specifically uh, in a locker room, identifying leaderships, different types of leadership, connecting with that leadership, and then that will spread the word within the locker room. And then the last step is, is the performance department. Uh, yeah, we deal with doctors that are very particular, uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, we, we lead with the strength coaches, which uh, especially here in the US have a very um, a strong organization, the same that the athletic trainers. Uh, and, and sometimes in some organizations, they may look like they work in silos. The, the strength coach does their thing and that's it. A physio or IT, the AT does their thing and that's it. And doctors, they said, I think that the way to change this and the same with the coaches and the player development coaches is to change the processes. Instead of trying to convince one by one what to do, you have to try to change. It's a paradigm shift. You have to change uh, the, the perspective of how, what a strength and conditioning session is and what are the items that we have to look. Well, if there's an activation and that will be focused on players' weaknesses, you have to talk with the physios who is the best diagnostician in the team to improve that uh, strength and conditioning. If the strength and conditioning is focused on physics and biomechanics, you may want to talk to the physio and the doctor to improve that bench press that is not helping that shoulder. Same approach with the coaches on court. Um, coaches have uh, basketball in mind, but they maybe are forgetting movement proficiency patterns that you can improve for to improve the change of direction that you are trying to work on a ladder uh, in the weight room. Uh, why it's better if that instead of a ladder is on core happening. That communication, that trust has to be built with the, with the basketball coach and so on. It's endless, um, it's endless, yeah. but it's very fun. Yeah, never ending story. And, and two more great uh, advices. First, we are service. I'm talking about performance specialists. We are service to players, to head coach, to the system. And also this is another topic, reading the situation in locker room, but not only in locker room, then in other situation, everywhere where we have some uh, communication demands, isn't it? Absolutely, that, that's okay. key. Okay, L let's go forward. Um, I would like to ask you about some topic uh, which are currently very interesting for all of us. Uh, one of main trends in team sports generally is about personalization, individualization of the process. In MBA, it seems uh, this demand uh, of individualization is accented because of pretty long out of season and off season period, even pre season, some parts. But please let us know your approach to, to this issue, to this topic. 
Yeah, this is related to your previous question. I think that the first thing is making sure that instead of you thinking that you know what the player needs, the first step is talk to the player and ask what the player needs and then build from there. But because that will help you to understand what he knows, he thinks, and, and what you need to help him or her to understand that he may, do, may uh, improve. Uh, as you well said, uh, our season, the whole season, in-season and off-season, uh, is very well defined and, and uh, they are very long. So the season might be six to eight months long uh, if you are the finalist. Um, and the off-season might be yeah, four to five months uh, long. Um, so because we have a really long off-season and this depends a lot on the organization, um, but the way that we approach it is when we have players um, in town and if they want, they can use our facility and, and we have assigned uh, and, a time, and a team of uh, uh, medical people, treatment people and strength coach working around each one of the players, this is split. And if the players are not in town and they are away, we try to, and we do uh, travel uh, abroad, wherever they are, uh, to make sure that we uh, keep implementing uh, our program and we do the best for them. And for to do this properly, and in terms of individualization, there is a word that, that I think that fits here, which is profiling. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a misunderstood word. I think that we don't test for the sake of testing. We, we test to profile the player and identify the weaknesses of the player uh, and to tweak, find tune the program that we are providing to the player. It's not just about Googling um, a strength program for professional player, copy, paste, and send, and he'll do it. No, uh, I think that our challenge is to find the best tools, the, fair, the best resources to profile our player uh, physically, uh, uh, strength-wise, physiologically, uh, cognitively, if it's possible, et cetera. And when we have an X-ray, discuss that X-ray with the player, himself and then develop the best program to improve and develop that especially in the off season because as you said the in season is very congested and develop development is slightly harder yeah profiling is the next uh, uh, word important for this conversation but important for all of us uh, we are facing with many different uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, every day in everyday uh, professional life uh, also uh, you had very tough experience in last uh, few weeks, uh, but it is usually almost in, in NBA to have in 15 days, uh, 10 games uh, in different places, traveling around. And then in this small uh, time frame, you have all life, whole uh, performance life situated inside. And also this part of individualization, how you face with, with this great challenge and great demand during the tight competition, congested competition calendar? The, uh, yes, I mean, this season has, visa, has been a, a very unique uh, schedule. Um, as you said, the second half of the season, we played 40 games in 68 days. The last 15 days, we played 10 games. And the last five days of the season, we played four games. So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, and it's, it's obvious that it's not just playing, it's we are also traveling. So that's less uh, recovery and less uh, training opportunity, obviously, which makes harder one uh, being well rested uh, or avoiding fatigue or reducing fatigue. And the other is developing players because we have we have 15 to 17 players in a roster. So you have players that uh, usually eight to 10 players that play most of the minutes. But that means that you have eight to five players that play little and usually they are younger. So if, if that's a, if the, the combination that they play less minutes and they are younger, you have to have uh, you have to be creative and find windows to actually keep developing because otherwise that means that for six months these players don't do anything other than traveling uh, which is not the case we there are opportunities and i think that uh each franchise tries to find uh, those opportunities sometimes it's right before of the game which is something that is different from europe but but the pre-game um preparation 
for us, it, it starts three hours before the, the tip off. And in those three hours, we have windows for each one of the players to develop their skills. Um, then when we are on the road, there is a minimum equipment that the team has to provide to the visiting team uh, for strength and conditioning. Uh, and then after the game, we use uh, uh, 20 to 35 minute sessions to keep developing the player in a, from a strength and conditioning point of view. Um, right. Right. I think that finding that the schedule and that window opportunity is, is critical. Then even we are talking generally about performance and post-formance activities regarding and related to training. But here, uh, your use uh, opportunity pre-game, performance pre-game performance, yes, and post-game performance uh, in that way, doesn't matter how we uh, call this uh, and how we title these uh, uh, topics, but generally you use every single opportunity, if I understood well, yeah. to uh, take care about not only uh, health and safety, then uh, about the performance and accumulation of some stimulus to have development during the season. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the, the last piece that we use a lot, uh, and this is used everywhere, but especially in the NBA's video, there is a lot of interaction with the player development coaches of individual videos and team videos, because that doesn't imply physical load, implies cognitive load, but it fits very well in such a congested schedule to keep developing the players. It is, uh, this job is kind of artistic, isn't it? Yeah. In that case, this time passed so fast, you know, and we are uh, pretty close to, to the end of our time frame. Uh, uh, please, for end of this session, uh, would you please be so kind to give advices for two group of persons? First, ELPA is European EuroLeague Players Association to give some advice to players generally what do you think it's important for them and also for performance specialists because they are mostly listening this interview and this epic congress and uh, they will for sure have a lot of benefits from this conversation and all, all epic congress yeah well i'm no one to give advice but i'll share what i think um First to the performance people, uh, I think, and we've discussed this uh, throughout this interview, but um, it's not about what you know. It's not about how much you know that for sure everyone here knows a lot. It's, it's about what your player and your organization needs. And, and that changes the way that you formulate the questions uh, because otherwise you feel that you know a lot and you're very strong in your opinions and you want to impose that methodology in your organization. And it should be the other way around. You first, to, you first have to recognize what the needs and the resources are in your organization, what the needs of every single player are, how your program fits in those needs, and then tweak the program and apply the program. That, that's absolutely critical in, in any environment. And I think that that would be a suggestion uh, for, for performance uh, staff. Uh, for players, uh, I think that, uh, more than a, an advice, it would be a, a kind request. Um, I think that, uh, and I understand, sometimes it, it seems that the sports scientist is just testing me. I, I feel like, like a guinea pig where I have to jump on this mat, I have to uh, give saliva, I have to uh, run this beep test. It's not just, or it shouldn't be just for the sports scientist to have a nice chart. It really should change and improve decision-making to be able to tweak and individualize the programs that we give uh, to the players, not just in the weight room. Um, if we think that we have a battery of tools that is not very invasive and fits our program, but gives us a very good picture of your readiness or your fatigue, that will give us strong arguments with the head coaches to tweak the weekly schedule, meaning instead of training two a days, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday and resting Thursday, maybe we can split the week differently uh, to with less load here and there to uh, get to the next game fresher. This sounds uh, like, like a cliche, but believe me that I said trust at the very beginning of the, this interview and trust implies a lot of things. 
uh, sometimes it's just communicating one to each other, but the other one is when you have objective information that is coming from the actor and you guys players are the actors, that uh, is very powerful when you are talking to the head coach. So if you guys players help us, we will help you to do better and that will uh, improve the team performance for sure. Fantastic advice is, if I can conclude, if they accept our service, they can stay healthy, they can improve performance and they can extend their careers, improve or prolong their athletic longevity. This last topic uh, is very important for them, isn't it? Absolutely. At the end of the day, that, that's what we want. Uh, seeing them enjoying on court for many, many years. Fantastic experience for me, I'm sure. It was a fantastic experience for our listeners, for our participants. Uh, I don't know if you know, we have more than 1,000 participants. I read we that. Con- we will continue with this, but with one main task, to try to contribute to this community for players, for coaches, for performance specialists, but also for all who are interested in this topic. Uh, a part of this that it was fantastic experience for us for all of us thank you again for participating in this uh, congress and also in front of all of us all our community i wish you all best good luck stay healthy and well i'm going to tell you because you were in uh, uh, in croatia zdravi i veseli bili it means stay healthy and well thank you so much And I hope you see you soon.